Okay, so I first um, begin class today. We're going to talk about a sort of grab bag of, of topics. We're going to see how far we can get. The first is um, discussion of inputting and outputting data in any logic. But before we get to that, I thought I'd uh, make an announcement. I thought I'd make an announcement regarding um, due dates uh, for various items. Um, this is a couple items sort of in the docket that I've been asked about. Um, so uh, the first is problem set three, which I handed out uh, a few days ago. Um, that consists of three problems. The first two are in the area of mobility. And uh, the final problem involves uh, calibration, which is a topic we should be getting to in the next few lectures. Uh, so the problem set is, is due December 6th. So that's the last day of class. That's the last day I'm allowed to have that due. Uh, and I'd like you to try to shoot for that because um, for, for the sake of our, our marker. Um, secondly, though, uh, people have been asked about deadlines for the presentations and for the actual projects. So um, presentations for this class will be due on the uh, 13th and 14th of December. So um, that will give you a little bit of time after the last day of class to try to make some further progress on those presentations. I'm a little bit flexible with this, but uh, I need to travel to the States to give a talk on the 16th. So if it's going to come after that, I'm open to talking about it, but it would have to be via Skype. Okay, So we'd have to set it up in a little bit um, more of an involved way. But I'm open to that. Project reports by default are due December 20th. Okay, um, that's time so that I can get to them uh, immediately after the obligations related to this talk um, and still hopefully get them all marked and everything by, um, by the requisite deadline at the end of December. So uh, I'd like you to see if you could uh, shoot for that for your project uh, deadline. Um, there are some extenuating circumstances for which I'll make accommodation. Um, and so if, if you think, you know, just an extra week would make a huge difference, come, come talk with me. Uh, this is a grad course, and we assume maturity on the part of people. I know there's one team uh, that's been working with distance constraints between the members, and I assured them extra flexibility at the beginning of class to accommodate that. But see if you can try to match uh, these deadlines. Uh, the presentations do not have to involve everyone in the class. We'll let people know when they're going to be held, and others should feel welcome to attend, but we won't require class you know, attendance on the part of everyone. Um, and I recognize some people may be gone, possibly, for the holidays by this point, in which case um, you know, I'll work with you to schedule things. Um, this, is, this is somewhat informal, but these are the last two days we could do them. I'm still allowing me to alight my flight. So any any other questions? It's yes. the last day of class is actually the fourth for this class, so do we get some more? Oh, okay. Um, like, if you look huh. right on my schedule. Is that right? It says the last day is the I classes. think the last day is the fifth, so that's uh, why I said. Oh, I see. Okay. I think. Okay. okay. Well, I've, I've said it already by sending it out, so um, I will definitely take them up to midnight the sixth. Um, no problem. Uh, and again, the, the, the material for the final project, uh, for the final uh, element of that problem set, I would urge you to wait until we discuss calibration to undertake that, um, because I think it will help make sense of what's going on. I would not recommend trying to do the third problem on that problem set yet. Wait, wait until we've covered it, because uh, there's going to be some associated conceptual material that will be quite important. Okay. Any questions on this? Yeah. Um, so the project presentation is going to be an opportunity to get feedback on the project. So depending on, on your scheduling, you may be able, I mean, there's a week separating these, you may be able to actually take into account some of that feedback um, in terms of doing further scenario runs or changing an assumption or trying you know, some interesting twist on adding, adding a bit of structure to the model or what have you. 
So some student projects in the past have benefited from this delay. In terms of sort of actual content and coverage, they can be pretty similar. I mean, what I would expect for the presentation is some understanding of, of uh, background and context, um, some motivation for why you're studying this, and um, some description of the model, and some description of the scenarios you ran with it, and some description of the results from those scenarios. Um, those would all, I would imagine, be things you want to feature in both the presentations and the reports. Okay. Um, but uh, you know, within the project report, you may wish to have more background material, things you're not able to cover. You may want to you know, uh, discuss sensitivity analyses runs that there's not the opportunity to cover within a presentation. Um, you may want to discuss alternative model structures that you looked at. Um, you may want to talk about the data sources, if any, that you used. Um, in, in greater detail of the sources, some of your assumptions. So the project report could be more um, uh, more extensive, uh, but if I would imagine a large overlap between what those two uh, what those two items cover. Does that address your question? Okay. Other questions? Good. Okay. Um, so with that in mind, uh, oh, that's interesting. Okay. I guess it's the white, the white, the white, the white board. Um, okay, so uh, I'd like to talk now about um, the first of our topics we're going to try to get to today, which is um, recording of, of results, so particularly output um, from models. And it, the discussion here reflects the fact that uh, a frequent modeler need is to record some components of model state over time, um, and Traditionally, um, we'll look at a variety of, of types of information, state variables, uh, states of particular agents, summaries of model state. And um, both AnyLogic Professional, the most expensive version of AnyLogic, and Vensum support recording this information, what I term a trajectory file. It, it records over time the contents of, of certain aspects of, of model state. Um, we don't have any logic professional here. We're not using that for the class. But any logic does allow for flexible recording of this information in other forms. And the most obvious is, is one that's called a data set. And we'll be looking at that more in just a few minutes. Um, you can also use statistics on population summarizing uh, model state. We've talked about that before. And um, you can report on values of, uh, from data sets or from ad hoc computations as graphs or tables. So um, what to record? Well, uh, just as some pointers, this isn't uh, to be taken um, uh, as an assumption. There's, uh, I mean, it, it goes beyond what you see at face value. In terms of what to record, the first and most obvious thing is an aspect of model state. What's the current state of the system? And this might be in an, an aggregated fashion, stocks or disaggregated the states of each agent within the system, reporting what particular state they're in a state chart or the values of stocks and flows within them, values of variables or parameters, etc. Another thing, though, that's a very common need is to capture changes in model state. Changes in model state over time. Within a system dynamics model, we'd look to flows to do that. That's where the action is. That's what changes the state over time. Within an, an agent-based model, what we look at instead is aspects of, um, uh, of variables that we might compute, um, compute manually. So we might have a variable that computes, for example, the number of infections that have occurred within the past unit time. And that variable might be uh, periodically refreshed, and we'll save that away. This is very important. Model state alone often doesn't give nearly as much insight as it does when you couple it with a description of what's changing, particularly if it's aggregated, right? If you're reporting on the number of, of infections and staying the same, you don't know if it's because there's still people getting infected, but there's people being recovered, or no one's getting infected at all, no one's being recovering at all. Big difference. Aspect of history, potentially individual history, um, 
But very importantly, and I want to highlight these to you because these are things that are oft overlooked. Model version number. I would suggest you model, you, you number the versions of your model. So every time you make a structural change in your model, you do so in a way that, um, uh, that increments the version number. Now, saving away that information then allows you to know the particular structural assumptions that were used to produce the data. So if you have output of data that's not marked with an indication of its provenance, what, with what model it was associated, it's very easy to get mistaken about where it came from, to misattribute it to a different structure than, in fact, produced it. So I would suggest saving away model version information. If you're saving away data in the various forms we'll talk about in spreadsheet files or in, um, in uh, databases, and saving away information about the assumptions, the parameter values, for example, the interventions under effect or the assumptions about the external situation, et cetera. So, uh, you know, if you're storing information on model state and flows, you'd, be, you'd do well to store the information, the provenance, the metadata associated with that, okay? Um, are you folks remotely hearing me okay? Very good. Okay. It's good news. Um, so if you are interested in doing flow statistics, there's a couple ways of doing this. Um, had I more time, I, I might go through a little demonstration. The first is you can have a variable that's zeroed out at the beginning of every interval. So there could be a timer that goes off, an event that goes off periodically in any logic, and it zeroes out a variable, and then that variable increments until that thing is going to be zeroed out again. So when that timer goes off, that event goes off, it saves away the value from the previous time unit, zeroes it out, and gets ready to accumulate new value from the next time unit. So every time a person gets infected, for example, it may increment that variable within the, the main class. So this is a very common uh, way to do it. Another way that's arguably even more informative is to have a variable that gives the cumulative number of events that have occurred over the course of the simulation. And when you want to record the number that have occurred within the last time unit, you just subtract away the value of that variable last time from its current value. And you get the delta, you get how much it's gone up. Because the variable gives the cumulative number, that difference is is the total count that I've <clears throat> So you might want to think about that. But let's talk now about techniques for outputting data. To, to do this, I'd like you to open a model that's called SAR agent-based calibration. Um, this particular model is can be found under the help menu, help and examples um, within any logic. And we're going to actually come back to this for three successive lectures, this particular model. Uh, the first will be this lecture on model output. The second will be uh, electron sensitivity analysis. In fact, four lectures, stochastics, sensitivity analysis, and uh, calibration. Okay. So if you go to any logic help, you should find it in the, um, in the set of, of models that are provided uh, along with any logic set of sample models. And in fact, I, sh I should have been uh, smarter in how I did that because I actually didn't need to just do help. You can actually directly from this go to the example models. You can't get to it from help, but um, it's better to just go to the example models. So if you do help example models and you scroll down here, you should be able to find SAR agent-based calibration. Okay. Um, okay, so this model will be getting rather familiar with how it works. In this context, I'm just using it as, uh, for, some, whoa, for some superstructure. Um, uh, associated with the um, uh, with the information. Uh, okay, so we're going to start with ad hoc uh, exports from variables. So I'd like you within this model to add in an experiment. Okay, um, so uh, as we'll see, okay, I've already got it loaded. It looks like um, uh, as we'll see in other lectures, uh, we will uh, have a uh, and, and several, several types of um, 
uh, of scenarios that we'll be using to run this model. In this case, we're going to use the most simple type, and we'll just add it in. Um, so uh, add a new experiment, and it can just be a standard um, a standard experiment. Nothing uh, nothing fancy required here. I'm seeing why this won't allow me to add in because I don't see it as included in here already. Oh, um, so pardon me for a second. It may be that it it just shares the same name. Incidentally, if you have two models that started from the same root, it's very common for them to conflict when you try to load them in because they have the same what's called their their um, package name is the same. And um, it will behoove you, if you're going to copy a model by saving it away, it will behoove you to, save, to change that package name um, before you do that. The package name is listed here under uh, the main model here, you'll see there's a package. And if you try to load a model that's derived from this, by default, its package name stays the same, and therefore it will conflict. So I'm going to add this in, and I'll add in an ex oh, not, not a dimension, an experiment. OK, experiment. And um, it's taking a while. Okay, I'll come back to this. Um, so call it simple experiment is fine or whatever name, it won't be uh, important. And I'd like you to run it to basically uh, demonstrate the essential uh, functionality. So sample experiment and it's regular simulation rather than an optimization. Um, so here's our simple experiment. And if we run it, the model uh, What we'll see is some basic information on the number of infectious individuals over time. There's what's called a data set here that we'll be exploring, and there's various parameters and some information on the environment and on the population within it. We can, of course, navigate down in various ways that we've done before. Um, but we see the, the basic uh, phenomena there. Okay, so while this is running, I'd actually like you to click on the variable called an infectious, okay? So you'll notice uh, within this, and I should have drawn more note to it, that there is a variable uh, called an infectious right up here. And if you click on that, you'll see its, its value um, changing. However, if you press this uh, button that showed a little graph here, what you'll see is you can readily create um, create a graph from that variable as it's changing over time. And that graph is updated. This is a, an example of sort of ad hoc visualization that we can do, sort of in the same way we can create graphs within Vensim um, retrospectively to look at what's, what's gone on. We can create these graphs simply by clicking on variables. Now, what's notable here is that while this is a pretty graph to look at, if you right click on it and you do copy, and then you go over to something like Excel and uh, create a new spreadsheet here, uh, what you'll see is that the values associated with that variable are time, both with their timestamps and the count are actually displayed. So it's very easy to, uh, coming from that, that source to output this. And I'll, I'll display them as a, as a scatter plot, but we'll see that, um, that same plot. So again, just right clicking on it and doing copy will allow you to, to copy that variable. Um, and it's uh, handy often to make use of that, uh, of that functionality. Um, you can, of course, uh, press the stop button to, to stop it. We're going to now take a look at some pre-prepared methods. And there's two methods that I'll highlight. One of them we've already seen, so I'm not going to spend much time on it. Um, and the other um, we haven't talked about as much, but I'll, I'll talk about a little bit more uh, here. So... Um, Let's talk about uh, statistics. So a population of agents can have statistics defined for it um, that calculate values. And these statistics get reported by default if you click on that population. So they can be used interactively on the one hand, but they uh, further can be called. So you can actually call them from your code to compute values. 
Now, they simplify the definition of the statistic that's used, as, as was noted a, a lecture or two ago, is fairly declarative. You just specify the condition you want it to capture, and it will count the number of people satisfying that condition. Or you've given an expression that calculates a value. Maybe it's a person's age or a person's number of pack years that they've smoked or what have you. And you, you, ask, uh, you ask the simulation to, um, to compute the max of that or the min of that or the average of that. And it will go ahead and do that. So um, there's a, a set of features that, that make this quite easy to use. And basically, these statistics calculate aspects of current model state. Again, they're not for, for flow statistics, but they calculate sort of based on the snap, snapshot of the model as it applies, um, as it applies now. So um, I'd like you to uh, select people here within the model. So select the, pro the population. And then I'd like you to go and uh, go to the statistics tab within the within this uh, area down here, this properties area. And you'll notice there's, there's no statistics currently uh, being listed. Um, we could add statistics uh, if we want to. Uh, for example, we might ask for the number of, of susceptible people. So, and then um, the current, this will define a statistic. There'll be an expression associated with it, which will be applied to each new population where that person is named item or referred to by the reference called item. So we can have um, a count. In, in this case, uses take advantage of the fact that people with it are associated with a state. And the state chart is called state chart. And so we're going to use that information to define the statistics. So we're going to ask their state chart. So if we have a reference to a person, we're going to get it and reference their state chart with this. Then we're going to ask is state active, and we'll give name of the state. Um, the state's name is susceptible, but because it's associated with the person class, and there might be multiple classes which have a notion of susceptibility, perhaps a deer class and a person class, we have to refer to it as the class name dot susceptible. So that's a, for those for computer science background, this is a static variable associated with the person class. Static in the sense it's associated, not not in the sense that it's not changing, although that happens to be true here, but in the sense that it's associated with the class and not with the not with the particular object of that class. So um, we have to say uh, a person not susceptible. So um, so again, this is item dot state chart dot is state active person not susceptible, and once we've done that. We can then go uh, run this sample experiment again, and we'll actually see something rather different. Specifically, what we'll see is, is that this, this is actually computed. And you'll see it's updated over time. So it's updating this um, uh, statistic as the number of susceptible individuals in the population uh, changes. In this case, it's declining rapidly. Um, so uh, that's an example of how statistics can be used for, um, for calculating values. And they're common. They're limited in terms of what they could include. But um, they are, uh, uh, they're fairly powerful for computing things uh, in a convenient fashion. Uh, this could, of course, formally be uh, exported if you were to copy from here and go over again to Excel. And, and paste in and could capture information from here. What's more notable and perhaps less obvious is that that statistic actually forms a method. Um, whoa, uh, so there's actually a method associated with that statistic, which is defined uh, associated with this person, with this people collection. So you can actually refer to that statistic in your code, people dot people stat begin paren, end paren, and it will calculate that value for you at a given time. Okay? Um, we could see that, for those of you who are interested, by opening up the, uh, the code associated with main, for example, open with Java editor, and we could go look for people stat in here. 
people's stat, and uh, what we'll find is um, it, it actually calls off to yet another thing, and here we go. So it loops through each person in the population, and what is this? Name the thing that stands before me highlighted. What is that? Where did that come from? From whence did that come? Sorry? Yeah, yeah, that was, the, that was the code we entered for the statistics. So whatever code we enter gets pasted in here. And you can see kind of, this is how it defines item. Item is just defined as part of the, as part of the, um, the context by virtue of where this code is pasted in. So that's a, kind of a glimpse behind the scenes of what's going on here. It's fairly declarative because when we declare this, all we have to know is item will be taken care of for us. It will represent a reference to a person and it takes care of the how. It takes care of pasting this in there and, and uh, making sure that that code is invoked at the right time. Okay, so um, that was a little bit on the stat side. This code, of course, uh, I think I may have mentioned that you can't modify it, it's, but it is sometimes um, handy to kind of go see what's there. Okay. Um, so some statistics, um, uh, right. Uh, so count susceptible, yes. Okay, so now I'd like you to drag a time plot over. Um, so uh, if we want to go find a time plot, we have to go down to the analysis side. And you'll see there's a variety of plots. Um, they can be used for a variety of purposes. For example, creating histograms. Um, we'll come back to histogram 2D, which is a two-dimensional histogram, um, time stack charts. You can also do X, Y plots, uh, for example, for phase plots, which plot one variable against another. But we're going to focus here on time plots. They're particularly easy to use. And when we call this, uh, we can add a data item, um, which we might call, you know, count susceptible according to this title. Um, and probably to, to make it uh, nice, we, you know, we'll do uh, plot, um, you know, um, uh, health breakdown or something like that. We might have multiple things computed in this. So we have count susceptible. And you'll notice we can either specify getting our values from a data set, which is accumulating them, which is a very flexible option, or we can specify a way to compute it right now. So based on what I've said, someone should be able to tell me now, how would I use the value of that statistic here? So if I wanted to plot out the number of susceptible people, how would I do that? Using the statistic I defined earlier. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So uh, people dot count susceptible. Um, okay, it's 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 uh, oh, hey, okay. Person, okay, yeah, people cannot be resolved, okay. Um, so, presumably, okay, that's that's interesting. Is that from, no, sorry, I, I uh, mistook it. So, it's uh, exhibiting displeasure. I'm in sort of the sudden death mode where if I have a uh, mistake, uh, it's called people stat. Why did I call it people stat? What a, what a horrible thing. Um, you folks should have, objected in strenuous terms to my to my abuse of, of the language there. Um, okay, so uh, now I called Count Susceptible. I just changed its name to Count Susceptible, and now it's a happy camper. And, um, and now if I run it, um, oh, but you'll notice there, there's a set of other things here, and this is actually germane to the, to the third problem set. Um, first of all, you'll notice there's a time window which specifies how big a, an interval of time to display. It is a time plot. There's a question about whether to scale it vertically in an automatic way or against a fixed, you know, uh, fixed limits here. And, um, and then there's a question of whether to update this automatically with a certain recurrence time or to, or to require manual updating by calling uh, on this plot something that says to update. And finally, it says display up to a certain number of samples. This is 
distinct from the issue of how long a time period to show. This is the number of samples to show, okay? Um, so uh, in this case, I'll leave it as, as 10 and, excuse me, as 100, and, and we'll see the, uh, the implications here. So now we have this plot here, and you'll notice that it's, it's showing at, um, uh, down to, to time 100, and we can speed it up, and it scrolled over there. Now it's the latest window of um, 100 to 200. Now this is the cause of some problems. These, these two, I particularly highlight this time window on the one hand and the display up to as jointly causing quite a bit of, of uh, or I should say independently causing quite a bit of confusion. I'm gonna change this time window to be a much shorter period and we'll see what the effect is. Um, so now we, ha we have a window of, of 10 time units, which is shown. And, okay, now that's, that's an interesting version. What happened here, folks? No one got infected the first, uh, first time. The person recovered and they didn't infect anyone. R0 was greater than zero. The basic reproductive number is greater, excuse me, greater than one. Uh, the, the infection should have spread if we thought this in a deterministic model, but just by the luck of the draw, it died out before it, it spread, the person recovered. But you'll notice that we're kind of getting a grand tour of time here. It's scrolling over um, to just always visualize uh, a period of 10, um, 10 time units. The other thing which causes, uh, so, so if it's scrolling a lot like that, that might be an indication that your time window is too short. By contrast, ladies and gentlemen, let's make the time, time window you know, as long as it was initially, let's say 200, because its entire time is 200. But let's display only up to the latest 10 samples. What should we expect to see now? Can anyone tell me? We only view the latest 10 samples, but within that time, time interval, this is what we should see. It looks like a, if, if um, I can be excused for using the term, it looks kind of like a snake. Um, so, it's, uh, you'll notice that it has the most recent 10, and you'll notice that, uh, you know, the curve goes somewhere up here to the left, but it's only showing the most recent 10. To make this even more pronounced, uh, I think I'll, show, I'll do it with a, a width of, of, of five data points. So watch this. So if we do this with five, now only show the latest five. And what you'll see is sort of the curve um, in a broader time window but only with the, the latest data points um, uh, shown. So here we have it proceeding slowly. You'll notice it looks discontinuous. There's nothing shown before this. And you might reasonably wonder what the world is going on. What's going on is that it's truncating it so, you know, visually. There, there are data points before that, but they're not shown. There's data points which will be coming up, and each time it adds a new data point, it eliminates one from earlier. Gotta watch out for that that count of points to be displayed as well, count of the time points. That will sometimes cause uh, cause confusion in this area. My own tendency is to just use large values for these uh, as large as required, and to not worry about it. I haven't um, haven't had occasion to have to lower those uh, for aesthetic reasons. Okay. Um, Right. Yes. Before you go any further, yes. Um, a lot of these graphs have uh, auto update the vertical axis. Yes. It takes them really, really hard to read. Is it there does. Any, like, rules of thumb for how to set the height appropriately. Yeah. Um, so in fact, in the problem set, I, I suggest overriding that um, so that it goes uh, in some defined uh, span. Well, one idea here might be. I mean, uh, personally, I think a natural vertical scale to use here um, would be to override the auto um, and to use a fix, make it from zero to the size of the population. Um, because after all, we may be visualizing, um, you know, the count of people within a population of a given size. And rather than having that axis changing and updating on a constant basis, we might want to have it be a 
a standard yardstick, a standard point of reference against which we we depict these things. And um, so I, you know, I I'd, I'd suggest doing something like that. Um, and then when you're making different runs and comparing them visually, you're comparing against you're comparing apples with apples. You're, you're you could look at it visually and get a sense of, um, of sort of what the uh, the dynamics are against the same point again frame of reference. So um, I will often use uh, fixed frames of reference for things, uh, fixed lengths. Sometimes, however, the auto is useful if you don't know ahead of time what range to look at. But you know, often this might be zero to one, or it might be zero to some fixed uh, parameters value. In which case, I think this is often often useful. Um, an important point here uh, along those lines is that if you if you were to do uh, other computations too, um, we might uh, to display things. You might have multiple things on the same graph, and then you want a graph which. You know, you're, it uses a range that speaks to both of those issues. So, number of infectious and number of susceptible, for example. So, we might have uh, count infectious here. Now, it turns out we can draw that from a data set. We're going to get to data sets in just a moment. But we could do count infectious DS and select data set here. Whoa, sorry. I thought it would keep that. Infectious DS. So, that's a data set of the count of infectious. And now in the same graph, we can have both infectious and susceptible. And once again, it kind of uh, brings home the, the fact that both are within as a fraction of the total population. Another thing you can do, which is sometimes useful, is normalize. Whoa, OK. Um, there goes the snake. Um, uh, so another thing you can do is normalize these against that variable. So, you know, fractions of the population and then have it standard 0 to 1 or something along those lines. But you write it as this record. Frankly, I find any logics, any uh, chart machinery a little bit, a little bit strange just how it does things sometimes. And imposing common um, axes is good. A real shortcoming of this, I should note, is that you can't have, to the best of my knowledge, in this version, you can't have two axes. So if you wanted to compare two different things, one, you know, fractional prevalence or, or what have you, one, the actual counts, you, that's not a good example, but, but two things on different graphs which would involve different scales, you can't really do that that well. Okay. Okay. Um, so what caused that snake to slither like that? Can anyone say? Okay, you folks may not know what I'm talking about, but um, uh, okay, so that, that's interesting. So this infectious DS, it looks like this 200 was too little for that, and that caused it that caused it to kind of slither over the screen. If we if we set it to a larger value, um, and in fact that's because I think it was uh, keeping it twice. If we set it to a larger value. Oh no, it's it's still in fact not large enough. What's going on with this infectious DS? Well, let's just go take a look at it. This is what's called a data set. Infectious DS is, okay, no, that's, uh, that's interesting. Um, ah, okay. The fox has shown its tail. Uh, so who can, who can tell me, point out to me the, the fox's tail? Why, why did we see that slithery behavior? I have no idea if you guys know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so, so, so uh, folks, when we ran this, there was, it exhibited slithering. Watch the blue. Behold the blue. Okay, watch this. It's even slowing it down for us. It's doing it in slow-mo. And watch this. Okay, so we have this going out to to there, and then look at that. See that? Does it look snake-like or not? Snake. Um, yeah. So it's it's it exhibits snakey snakeness. Now, if we go uh, and we go and we look at um, we look at this time plot, the, the the source of the snakiness is not evident. So after all, it tells it 
to have a time window of, of 200. And I went and I flailed against it and I put in 2,000. My hypothesis was, oh, maybe this infectious DS was sampling very, very quickly. And so it needed more than 200 data points to have it. So I increased it to 2,000. I think, okay, that will, that will protect us from the snake. But the snake returned. It remained. And the snake haunts us even now. So, so then I said, then I went over here, and I, I'm kind of mixing metaphors, sorry. Um, and, and I noted that when I looked at this, I said, okay, the fox has shown its tail. So now the snake became a, a fox. Um, but uh, what's the problem here, folks? Yeah, it only, so the data set, moreover, has a limit. I'm actually emphasizing this because I've seen this many times in running my examples, and I, I used to kind of go back and kind of look around to try to find the source. There's a couple of common sources, and I've just shown three of them. One is time window issue. One is the number of data points. One is number of data points in the graph, time window in the graph, and another one is for the data set, the number of samples that it keeps. This only keeps the latest 100. Now, if we changed it um, to be uh, 200, And we were to go look at this, um, we could. What we'd see is that it uh, keeps it just fine. Now, I'm not actually answering a question. Some of the more perceptive ones of you might have captured, but um, uh, there was a, an issue of a pathology with the data set. Okay, um, so let's let's talk some about uh, about data sets. Okay. Um, Okay, so um, so data sets store recent values of qu quantities from the model. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, what did you use as your uh, y-axis value? Uh, the y-axis value, I did it between zero, for the graph you're talking yes. about. For the graph, I did it between zero and the total population. Okay, thanks. Okay, um, so you'll notice here that the y-axis is imposed for all of the items. Here we declared it as fixed rather than auto, and it went from zero to total population. And total population is this parameter up here. Okay. So that's um, the scale of y-axis. That's the scale of the y-axis. So, yeah. How about its value? Oh, um, the y-axis value is different for each of the data sets that's shown. In other words, the place from which it gets the value to be displayed is, is uh, can be specified for each so-called data item. So for the first data item, the point to be displayed, the, the, the y value of the point to be displayed is people.com susceptible. For the second one, it's a value from, it's sort of the current value from infectious DS, okay? Um, and an important point here is that the, the x-axis is in common between the two. And the x-axis here is what, ladies and gentlemen? It is, it is time. Thank you. Yeah, that's right. So, so time axis is in common. Um, the y values that are shown are different, but there's a common y-axis, which is, is further in common in terms of its limits. And that's just defined by this vertical scale. Does that make sense? Okay. 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 So let's talk about data sets. I noted data sets store recent values of quantities from the model, and they can be exported easily using custom code. They can also be manually exported quite readily. So if we go back to our snake, well, okay, our model has been desnaked now. Um, but let's let's go uh, run this and. Um, here we go. Uh, if we were to uh, let, let it uh, go to its um, snake hood, and then if we were to click on that, we'll notice that that this data set actually maintains records of each of the items uh, within it. Okay. Um, we could copy that, and just as before, we could go uh, very readily paste it paste it into a spreadsheet. Um, uh, you'll notice that this is different from, from a variable. A variable after the fact, for example, we can't really graph out after the fact. It only can start 
well, if we start graphing it early, it can keep on updating it. Let's let's try running this to see the difference. Um, see what this data set buys us. We can click here, and whoa, okay, it's going too fast. Sorry, I I uh, made it made it. Whoa, whoa, man. Um, let's whoa, gosh. Um, okay, there we go. Let's let's go here. Okay, so. You'll notice with the data set it's accumulating with this variable, all I see is the current value. Now, if I remember to do it early enough, I can I can graph it out. But with the data set, it's just accumulating these values in a way I can I can export later. Um, now, if I run this thing uh, all the way to its end, I can I can go and I can click in an ad hoc way on that variable and get up the values, but their spacing is not it's not uniform. It's not sampling them at the same regular weight rate as is the data set. So in the definition of the data set, you specify how frequently to save this. So, um, so if we go to the data set here, what we'll see is it actually says recurrence time of two. So it updates the data automatically every two time steps. Okay. Um, hence, um, and we okay. That's that's interesting that this is looking every every one time. So I'd have to go uh, check check on that. But um, there may be something else adding adding these things in there. So you can set how frequently you want it to uh, to update. Um, okay. Um, so data sets can be manually updated from code. You can actually call code and say add this data point, add that data data point, or they can update automatically with a certain recurrence time. Um, and beginning at a certain time. Okay. Um, okay, that's um, right. Uh, so for a data set, let, let's go take a look at this a little bit more. You'll notice with the data set, we also have a chance to, as to what to record in terms of its um, its x and y values. So it records pairs of values. Here we're recording time as the horizontal axis value. So it's time stamping things, and you're recording something for the vertical axis value. On the other hand, you could create a data set which is recording two variables against one another, as I say, like a, a classic phase plot. Okay. Um, okay. Um, now charts can use data sets. We saw this earlier. So if we have a time plot, for example, we could refer it to a data set, and it would output things from that. I should note that state variables um, within the model, as shown as stocks, uh, also you can record, uh, you can get information from, and you can copy values from. Uh, you could use uh, the graphing, ad hoc graphing, you can export from them. So it's almost as if they, uh, they have uh, a capacity to store this sort of information well, as well, almost like they have a data set along, alongside them. Um, in a way, it's not that different from what we see with a regular variable, though. Uh, okay, so let's. Um, well, okay, so I think we've we've uh, seen this right. Um, okay, so data sets. Um, well, we've seen that you give an expression to calculate it. Um, so there's several types of data sets supported within any logic. Uh, I've referred to simple, timed. Um, sorry, not to simple. Simple holds values only, no timestamps, just successive values. Timed holds values and timestamps. Phase holds pairs of values, but no timestamps. Um, you can think of timed as a phase type data set where one of the values is, is time. And then histograms, which can define bins for the data set. And the data set will record the number that fall into that bin. So it can record over time sort of the distribution, as it were, the empirical distribution associated with a given quantity, okay? Um, so uh, you could record the distribution in terms of the number of people being infected per time unit or what have you. Um, okay, uh, I think what I'll do is just because we're talking about data sets, I think what, what I'll talk about now is outputting code from data sets to, um, to files. Now, to do this, um, uh, there's, there's two steps required. One is you have to specify it, how to find the necessary Java library to do this. Okay? This is the first time we will have seen this within any logic. 
you actually have to point it to a certain Java library. Any logic model can be pointed to external Java libraries uh, in the form of, say, .jar files. They can also be pointed to, um, to built-in uh, Java libraries that are part of the standard Java runtime, but you have to, you have to tell it to make use of those, um, those libraries. And then you have to define the code. So we're going to see uh, how we do this. So the first thing is, in the main class, if, if, that's what's to, if that's where the data sets live, because you can have data sets at the individual level too, but if your data sets are in the main class, under the advanced tab, you want to put in this import statement. And this import statement basically tells uh, any logic, and by extension Java, to go and import um, uh, classes um, that uh, will accomplish various useful things from the java.io library. And ladies and gentlemen from computer science background, what does IO stand for here? Thank you. Um, yeah. Anyone who's taken certain economics classes might also know that the same, um, same acronym is used there, um, but in a different context of Leontiefs, uh, et cetera. So this is java.io.star. Um, so it knows how to use things in java.io. And so then um, to do this, we actually have to insert some code um, this code could be placed in the main class to actually output to a file. And so there's some code here listed. Basically, it creates what's called a file output stream, which knows how to output it to a certain file. We create a print stream from that, and then we print to that print stream. Okay? Um, we print to a file, in other words. Um, and what do we print? We print the data set to a file. And when the data set prints to a file, it outputs a tab-separated file. And a tab-separated file is notable because it can be readily imported into tools like R or Excel or SAS, et cetera. So um, here we are outputting data from a data set to a file so that it can be used um, externally rather than copying it manually. Okay. Um, and for greater versatility, this is best placed in a function, so you could take in, for example, the name of the file. I should note that there's this try catch statement around here to catch a variety of errors that can occur when you try to write to a file. Those from computer, computer science background, give me some types of errors that can occur when you try to write to a file. Out of disk space, what's another one? Does not exist, or directory does not exist, or something. Okay, directory does not exist. Another one. I/O error. Another one. You don't have permissions to access it. Um, these are these are all reasons why there might be trouble. And the way in which we signal trouble in Java, the typical way is by doing what? <laughs> we do what? Thank, thank you. Yeah. So we, we throw an exception and say something exceptional has happened. Um, please help me handle it. And there'll be certain parties typically that have called us that will will say, okay, I can handle that exception. I'll do something. In this case, it just says could not write to the file. We should have given the name of the file. Um, so there's a bit of code which handles output uh, output to a file from a data set. Okay, um, this is very easy to perform. Uh, very easy to import that data into a variety of tools, and files can be readily archived. Archived. Um, the cons are, it's often awkward to to draw multiple types of of uh, data um, into into. Excuse me. This is a different point. Um, there's actually two points here, and I should really edit this. So awkward to have multiple data sets output to the same file. Um, if they're to be output in this way, they'd be output vertically within the same file, one after the other. So you'd have 
time going up and going up for one, reaching its end time, and then time starting and going up and up and up for the next. Um, it's awkward to combine data from multiple output files into the same Excel sheet or, or an R. Well, R, it's not too bad. Um, and uh, you're going to either have to output a header section to give metadata of relevance, like what model version was used, what parameter assumptions, or you're going to need to duplicate that on each line. So, you know, files are, are okay. Uh, they're, not, they're not great. Another option is to output to the console, and we've seen this through through class. So you can do trace ln. If you do it in a main class, you do it in an agent class, it's called implicitly on this, and it just outputs a string to the console. If you want it to appear in different colors, you can do system.error.println, which outputs to the what, folks? For, for someone from computer science background, what am I writing to here? Senator. Yeah, standard error, the error stream. So the error stream is a special stream which is used for warnings, but particularly errors, sometimes for warnings, but particularly errors. And what's notable is that this appears in red when it occurs. So it appears in the console, but it appears in red. So it's very easy to spot these things. So if you want to output a significant event, you want you want to be able to notice it easily, you could use this this guy here, system.error.println, uh, rather than trace ln. Um, this is readily visible. It can appear in front of you, and you can copy and paste it to another document. Okay? Um, so, you know, every time someone gets infected, they could output, and you can see, oh, people are getting infected. It's a very common, uh, common thing to, to do when you're debugging your model or... Um, when you're trying to understand what's going on, trying to explain the emergent behavior. The cons here is that it may be mixed with other output. It's of limited length, so eventually it will run out of space and it won't remember the earlier things. It depends on your memory as a, as a modeler to copy it, and it's less structured. There's no, it's no structure imposed. No, arguably, that's a, that's a desirable thing sometimes as well. Okay. Um, uh, you know, more general option, more powerful option is to output to databases. These could include everything from sort of lighter weight databases like H2 or Microsoft Access up to medium scale databases um, uh, on the smaller side, MySQL, medium scale things like uh, Postgres and SQL Server, um, up to things like DB2 and Oracle which are designed to handle very, very large terabyte level data sets. Um, and uh, Google has some um, emerging cloud-based um, uh, data structures, which are also very powerful, which you could in principle write to. Um, so this is more flexible than string output. We can query from diverse tools. So a database, we can grab data from that database from tools like R, SPSS, SAS, Excel, etc., we can easily clean it up. Um, and larger databases are transactional, and we can query from remote machines. So if you have something on on MySQL, you have something on Postgres, um, you have something on SQL Server. Certainly, at least for those later two, I think I think MySQL uh, also serves multiple clients, right, on multiple uh, computers. So um, you should be able to do that. Um, you can use it for multiple machines, although you're going to take a hit in terms of network speed. And it's transactional. Uh, you can make it transactional, meaning you can either write, it either is guaranteed to write entirely or not at all, which means no half, half output files or what have you, less chance of corruption. The cons here, there's more programming, and you need to set up a database. Um, and uh, that can require some, some consultations. So the steps to outputting to a database, you have to set up the database on a computer and add reference to database libraries to any logic model. And then each, some periodically during simulation, you may output a database. You, oh, sorry, excuse me. Um, during simulation, you output a database, you create a database connection at the start of the model, then you insert into it throughout the model or you draw values from it using, S, uh, using SQL queries. Um, 
and at the end of the model execution, you close it. Um, so there's a variety of databases, some of which are more desktop-based and some of which are, are shared over, uh, could be shared over a network. Um, so this is an example of, um, of a database reference to some MySQL libraries for, for outputting to a database, um, or for that matter, for, for inputting from a database. So this is to MySQL as a jar of libraries. Um, okay, um, we, we have database classes that, that we've used in my group. If anyone's interested in them, I'm glad to provide them. They're just wrappers for SQL. Um, and they take care of some things uh, regarding opening connections, et cetera. Um, okay, um, so we set up a database class for that. Um, so when you output to a database, you really do want to maintain metadata, as I emphasize, parameter settings, model version, purpose of the run. So you can know when you reflect on it, okay, what was I trying to accomplish with this run? What did I learn from it, et cetera? Uh, be mindful of the performance and space burdens. Um, I would suggest opening the connection at the beginning of the simulation, not repeatedly during it, and try to batch up data inserts so they can occur at a single time, particularly if you're going over a network um, to a database remotely. And be selective what data to store. You could output all the data you want to a database throughout a simulation, but sometimes all you're interested in really is the values at the end of the simulation. You should think very carefully about whether to output values during a simulation because that can get very easily into the multi-gigabyte range. Although I will say one of the real virtues of a database is that you can clean it up very quickly, um, very easily. You could just uh, erase data associated with a model version that's fine to be buggy, for example. Um, you can also get database input. Um, so for example, we can draw connections from a database or from a file. And in fact, there's some example models that I've provided to you where it draws connections from PIAC files or other specification. Um, you could use this data to, to choreograph agent movement within some space or to, um, to feed in data that's used for calibration. And uh, sometimes this data, often it's quantized into time units and you may want to use dynamic events to schedule things. So you have some amount of bursts that have to occur in this year, and then you distribute them throughout the year with dynamic events. So those events will go off. So I've presented some basic information here on um,